Yes, yes. And uh, uh, is the screen up? Yes. Okay. Thank you uh, so much, Kasturi, uh, for your nice introduction and to the organizers of this uh, symposium. Uh, and uh, good evening to uh, everybody watching. Uh, my task uh, was uh, to talk on uh, how I evaluate severity and activity of thyroid eye disease. Uh, and in doing that assessment, how we ultimately manage this uh, troubling condition. And uh, my only disclosure is that I'm an unfunded uh, investigator and consultant for Immunivant. As we know, thyroid eye disease is the most common orbital disease worldwide. It's an autoimmune process that uh, causes inflammation, expansion, and in some cases, scarring of orbital soft tissues, including the orbital fat, uh, the extraocular muscles, the levator muscle, and uh, lacrimal gland. Uh, these uh, soft tissue changes uh, can lead to significant visual and cosmetic morbidity, which impacts uh, work, social life, and quality of life. One of the challenges uh, with this is, uh, can I minimize this screen here? There. One of the uh, um, challenges with this disease, uh, because of the broad spectrum of uh, clinical manifestations, is how we actually catalog these uh, different uh, soft tissue changes and their severity, uh, how we monitor the course of the disease and uh, choose appropriate management. And that's the focus of this talk. Well, what is the concept of disease severity? That refers to the different anatomic and functional changes that result in the orbit as a result of the soft tissue uh, damage from the immune process, uh, monitoring both uh, uh, the severity, uh, but also the activity. In other words, uh, uh, where in the immune process this is. In my practice, uh, two thirds of patients roughly have primarily orbital fat expansion with uh, potential levator muscle uh, tightening, uh, causing eyelid retraction and proptosis and exposure symptoms and signs. These patients usually are young, have a very indolent onset without much soft tissue congestion or inflammation, uh, are not uh, necessarily smokers, um, but can lead nonetheless to quite severe alterations in their appearance. At the other end of the spectrum are those more severely affected functionally uh, and these uh, have one or more of the extraocular muscles uh, enlarged and inflamed. And the swelling of these muscles can lead to congestion of the orbital venous uh, drainage, leading to inflammatory soft tissue changes or congestive changes, as well as a restriction in motility. And in those cases where the nerve can be compressed in the tight orbital apex by these swollen muscles may lead to vision loss from optic nerve compression. This latter group is, um, this uh, latter group uh, typically are older patients, uh, more equal uh, gender distribution. The fat expansion group primarily is female uh, to male five to one ratio, whereas this uh, muscle expansion group is a more equal gender distribution. And this has a very rapid onset uh, which uh, um, is easily documented by the patient and the clinician uh, more acutely, uh, also associated with smoking and a family history. And this latter myogenic group are, uh, or myopathic group uh, have a very obvious biphasic uh, course as described by Rundle uh, back in the 1940s. Uh, the active phase uh, consists of progressive deterioration in uh, symptoms and signs relating to the orbit, which can last anywhere from half to one and a half years uh, before the disease eventually uh, um, dies down or the immune process dies down. Uh, but the patient is often led, left with significant orbital sequelae. 
the hope in these cases is to identify this severe group early on in the process uh, and offer immunotherapy or radiotherapy to uh, interfere with that immune cascade and hopefully result in fewer uh, severe visual and functional changes. Only once the disease has uh, stabilized do we usually consider surgical rehabilitation, uh, although the exception is in uh, cases where vision is threatened from corneal breakdown or from optic nerve compression, uh, in which case uh, surgery may be offered even early in the active phase uh, to try and reverse the process. As you can see then, it's important we not only determine the severity uh, of the disease, the, the different um, clinical features and how badly the patient is affected, but also the course of the disease, whether we're going to offer medical uh, therapy or radiotherapy or potentially surgery. Well, what are the strategies for uh, grading severity? The common one uh, used uh, particularly amongst endocrinologists is the European group of uh, grades orthopathy or UGOGO system. Uh, they grade uh, mild, moderate, severe, and very severe based largely on treatment categories. Uh, this uh, uh, is quite helpful for referral. So uh, moderate to severe often are treated medically or referred to a center where medicines are chosen and uh, site threatening conditions, which are the very severe ones may require surgery. However, I think there are limitations with this uh, one with the system. One is that the terminology often ignores the patient perspective. For example, someone that uh, might be called mild because they've got proptosis of 24 millimeters uh, but, uh, and lid retraction uh, may still be very severely bothered or uh, impacted by their disease. And likewise, someone at the other end of the spectrum who has uh, optic neuropathy that only manifests with some mild color vision change wouldn't really consider themselves necessarily very, very severely affected. Also, there are mixed clinical features within the groups. So uh, proptosis, for example, can appear in all three groups. And I, I, I think a system, this uh, uh, confuses management uh, potentially. For example, moderate to severe, often the management um, systems using this uh, uh, UGOGO system recommends a steroid therapy. Proptosis, for example, doesn't work well uh, or doesn't respond well to corticosteroids. What about existing uh, activity measures? Uh, well, the, I think most of you will be familiar with the clinical activity score introduced by the Amsterdam group. This gives a one point uh, for lid or conjunctival redness, lid conjunctival or carunculer edema or pain, and an additional point on follow-up visits if there's a measurable deterioration in vision, proptosis, or motility. This is a quick, easy scoring system. It was devised to predict responsiveness to corticosteroids, which was the available treatment at the time. And generally, it uh, can be used as a surrogate marker for um, inflammatory activity. But there are limitations. It's a binary scale. So you can have a measurable or an obvious improvement, let's say, in chemosis, but still have a little chemosis, and that doesn't reflect as improvement in the score. There's an equal weight for each variable. So someone, for example, may have a drop in five lines in vision, and that only gets a point in the CAS score, as well as someone who just has some mild injection one day from dry eye. And it's uncertain uh, if the clinical activity score actually predicts any progression in disease. There are also important false negatives and positives to be aware of. I mentioned the lipogenic phenotype uh, without uh, much extraocular muscle involvement. These patients may develop quite marked proptosis and lid retraction uh, without ever developing uh, a significant CAS score. And also another group are East Asian patients who may develop quite striking uh, extraocular muscle at the apex, leading to severe vision loss from optic neuropathy, often with, again, very little evidence of uh, um, uh, inflammatory soft tissue changes. And then there are some false positives. Uh, this patient was on uh, the corticosteroids and uh, uh, CELSEP 
for a year and a half trying to treat congestion when she was referred to me, but in fact had no progressive disease by history. Uh, she really was just congested because of swollen muscles and simple surgery and uh, uh, discontinuation of all her medicines was possible. I prefer actually a system uh, of grading activity based more on the clinical uh, course of the disease, uh, documenting is it a brief duration, has there been a rapid rate of onset, and specifically both from the patient perspective and the clinician measuring from visit to visit, whether you can measure actual changes in any one of the uh, severity parameters. And you can corroborate that with uh, changes in TSH receptor antibodies and imaging support. Uh, contrast CT on this uh, example uh, shows active disease on the uh, patient's left orbit uh, and old quiescent swollen muscles from a previous attack on the right side where you have hypolucent uh, non-contrast enhanced muscles. Uh, likewise, on T2 or stir-weighted MRI, uh, you can see enhancement uh, often in the active muscles uh, from uh, inflammatory edema. I'll introduce the visa classification, uh, which uh, ITEDS has adopted and uh, which uh, Jack Rubin and I introduced in 2006, uh, which uh, tries to record severity and activity in one clinical recording form. Um, and focuses on four uh, disease uh, severity parameters. So it divides uh, the disease into uh, vision or optic neuropathy, inflammation, congestion, uh, soft tissue changes, strabismus, including diplopia and appearance exposure changes. It uh, has both the patient's subjective input for each of these, as well as measurable uh, changes, uh, uh, for example, in vision, you'd record the central vision, color vision, uh, pupil response, appearance of the optic nerve, uh, all clustered within that particular parameter. And then you can, at the bottom of the sheet, for each parameter, determine whether they're mild, moderately, or severely affected. And in terms of activity, not basis on any soft tissue score, but whether there has been subjective or objective progression in any one of these parameters. So for example, if someone uh, has optic neuropathy, we try to rule that out first. Uh, subjectively, we ask about vision loss, faded colors. Objectively, we measure uh, the signs uh, suggestive of optic nerve compression. We can support it with the visual fields and a coronal CT scan in the case of compressive optic neuropathy. And if present, then choose selective management. For each one of the severity parameters, after you've determined uh, whether they have features and how severely they're affected, you, then for, you can then ask, are they progressive or not? Are they active or not? In optic neuropathy, they typically are active when they declare themselves. In this case, uh, corticosteroids and radiotherapy have both been shown uh, uh, by a number of studies to be effective for this condition. Uh, optic neuropathy can even be uh, avoided if uh, radiotherapy is offered early. Uh, and in cases where uh, medical or radiotherapy is ineffective or insufficient, uh, you can consider surgical decompression, expanding the orbit into the adjoining sinus and relieving pressure on the nerve. The inflammation congestion score uh, refers to any soft tissue change. And remember that may not just be inflammation representing activity, but we pointed out you could have passive congestion from long-standing muscle swelling without any, with the disease already having died out, or you can have exposure change without progression, uh, but just damage on the surface from uh, poor lid closure and proptosis. So in this system, we look at these soft tissue changes, uh, not uh, as an activity score like CAS with an absolute number, but rather as a feature of the disease or a severity parameter. And, in, and, and activity really would be looked at as a worsening in the visa score uh, whether it's the inflammation, the vision, uh, strabismus, or appearance. 
You can see the visa score is based completely on the CAS score with the slight change that uh, lid edema and conjunctival edema are measured on a three point score to reflect a, a, a measurable improvement or worsening. So again, if someone presents with a lot of soft tissue scores, you can grade that using the visa score, similar to the CAS score, but ask whether it's recent onset or progressive or document it. If it is recent onset and getting worse, uh, then we can do the usual measures. And this is the large category where the various medical options are available to interfere with targeted uh, parts of the immune pathway, which will be discussed uh, shortly. So corticosteroids, uh, radiotherapy, and the uh, newer uh, biologic agents such as tocilizumab and tepratumumab are all possibilities uh, in this myogenic, uh, more severe group, not only to try to avoid the onset of uh, um, uh, things like strabismus or optic neuropathy, but to reverse them. Notice that steroids and radiotherapy are very good at reversing congestion and uh, uh, swelling, uh, but do not have much effect on lid retraction and don't generally have much effect on proptosis, unlike some of the newer agents like tepratumumab. If a patient has long-standing disease, however, and if there's no progression, this is a sign not of activity, but rather chronic muscle congestion of the venous drainage. And here medicines won't be useful, but rather orbital decompression will restore the uh, patient's uh, or improve the patient's situation. The last two groups are uh, strabismus and appearance. Strabismus and diplopia are the worst uh, um, manifestations of the disease according to most quality of life uh, surveys. Uh, diplopia can be measured on the Ban Gorman scale, uh, that is diplopia only with gaze, diplopia intermittently, or the worst case diplopia at primary. Uh, objectively, if you want to measure ductions, a useful technique is to use a light uh, pupil reflex where the light is shone in the eye. As a patient looks up, if it hits the limbus, it's 45. If it hits the edge of the pupil, 15, and halfway between is 30 degrees. And this is very reproducible in multicenter studies. Again, once you've documented the severity, what, how bad the strabismus is or how bad the ductions are, determine if they're in a progressive phase based on any change in the visa parameters. Uh, if so, then uh, patch prisms and uh, various uh, immunomodulators, steroids plus radiotherapy, tepratumumab or tocilizumab if available. But once the disease has reached a stable point, typically surgery or patches or prisms are offered to try to realign the patient. Finally, appearance exposure changes. This may be both because of myopathic disease or at the other end of the spectrum, the lipogenic fat expansion with lid retraction. Uh, in these cases, again, if they are in a progressive change with progressive worsening in the lid retraction or proptosis or swelling of the a levator with a contrast enhancement showing that this uh, muscle is being targeted, then you could consider subconjunctival uh, corticosteroid uh, into the area of the levator has been shown helpful at uh, lowering the lid. Uh, selenium has shown some benefit in lid retraction. And most interestingly, recently, tepratumumab seems to, in this lipogenic group, even reverse proptosis and fat expansion potentially. Ultimately, many of these patients, nonetheless, in spite of therapy, uh, will benefit mostly from surgery. And fortunately, the surgical results can be uh, very positive. So I'll finish by saying it's important in assessing our patients to determine their severity, that is, what features of the disease they have and how badly they're effective. And in the visa system, that would be uh, vision, inflammation, strabismus, and appearance. Uh, recognize if they're in the myopathic group, in which case they're more likely to get uh, serious complications like uh, vision loss or a double vision. And within each cluster, is it progressive or is it active or inactive? Activity uh, being defined primarily by progression in disease. And here the various 
corticosteroid, radiotherapy, and the newer uh, immunomodulators, uh, targeted uh, immune therapy uh, are offered in the progressive phase in all of these categories. Uh, but once they've reached stable phase, surgery is offered. And the last category, appearance, uh, typically progressively, uh, we uh, treat conservatively, but once stable, uh, would consider decompression and lid surgery. Uh, thank you very much.